I think this is a very, very exciting day because it's been a day, it's a day that's been in the planning for quite a while. Uh, it's a day where a lot of people sat down um, to think how best to honor a very, very important gentleman. And this gentleman is Professor Francis Mwega. Professor Francis Mwega has got links or had links to all sorts of institutions, but two specific ones got together and said he was there for these two institutions um, in a very special way. These two institutions are where we are right now, the University of Nairobi and the Central Bank of Kenya. Professor Mwega unfortunately left us um, almost exactly a year ago. Uh, he had served with distinction um, on the Monetary Policy Committee, the Monetary Policy Advisory Committee here at the University of Nairobi and a lot of institutions both here in Kenya and all around the world. And we thought the best way to honor Professor Mwega is to do what he did best, which is impart knowledge. So that's what we are doing here this afternoon. And I think almost everyone I'm looking at has a notebook in front of them because they want knowledge imparted to them. So Karibuni again. Uh, we have very special guests with us, um, and I'll just go through a few of them. Uh, there's many, many more all around the room. Uh, Odero Chow, who I have a boss who happens to be the governor of the Central Bank of Kenya, but he truly, truly is a boss because Odero Chow is the deputy governor of the Bank of South Sudan. Now, those initials, B-O-S-S, -S, actually spell out boss. So he is a true boss. Uh, we have... Uh, the former governor of the Central Bank of Kenya, Professor Njuguna Ndongo, who is here with us. We have Honorable Shaquille Shabir, who's sitting right in front uh, here, who's a member of the Finance Committee um, in our parliament. We have Lamin Majang, who is a CEO of Standard Chartered Bank, and we have a lot of other representatives from commercial banks um, sitting with us. We have representatives from the National Treasury. Uh, we have um, a set of people who I want to introduce um, very specially, simply because they are the ones who, in Africa, we always say you're never alone. You're always with the people around you, and those people are the family. So um, these ones I'll please ask to stand up um, so that we can recognize them specially. I'll begin with uh, Mercy Mwega, who um, is Professor Mwega's widow. Uh, sorry, my eyesight is a bit funny. Yes, there she is. If you can please recognize her with a round of applause. Mama, if you can please remain standing so that you're joined by your family members, Anne. A round of applause, please. Stephen. And Vincent. So we're glad to have you and thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, and please take your seats. We also have another uh, set of individuals who I will be recognizing as we go along, but the one who I do not want to leave out is our Deputy Governor of uh, the Central Bank of Kenya, uh, Sheila Mijue, who's sitting right in front of us. Uh, the rest you'll be hearing from because they'll come up here to speak. So without too much ado, I want to ask uh, Professor Njero to please come and join us. He's representing Professor Peter Mbithi, who is a Vice Chancellor of this university. Um, to please come and welcome us to this magnificent hall and also to the University of Nairobi. Dr. Jeroge, uh, Deputy Governor, Central Bank of Kenya, and Kenya again, Governor, Bank of Uganda, Deputy Governor, Bank of S Southern Sudan, South Sudan, and the former governor, Central Bank of Kenya, my colleague, Professor Njuguna Ndungu, Ramin Manjang, CEO of Standard Bank, CEOs of all banks represented here, the vice chancellors, and of course, importantly, uh, the family of the late uh, Professor Mwega. Now, if you allow me, ladies and gentlemen, and distinguished guests, and everybody that we have invited here, 
there are so many distinguished guests, ladies and the gentlemen, and the people with the clout, and more clout than I am familiar with. If I don't mention um, your name and the status you understand, uh, it is because it is our pleasure to have you here, uh, feeling, especially feeling this hall. This is a big hall, um, hardly uh, easy to feel, but you've done that and I can see uh, some people out there. So I want to take special recognition of the importance of this day um, and um, uh, granted that the central, the, the, the governor of the Central Bank of Kenya uh, is with us here among the other distinguished guests. My name is Jeru, Enos Jeru, principal of the College of Humanities and Social Sciences, but I'm here welcoming you on behalf of the Vice Chancellor, Professor Mbidi, like the MC uh, has uh, told you. Uh, the VC uh, was just called to another critical meeting and he was told, just come. Then he called me uh, and told me, uh, just come. Of course, with me, <laughs> with me, it is not. Uh, it wasn't simply uh, an issue of just to come. Uh, I'm always uh, under instruction and waiting for instruction. My office is a delegated authority, so I will always come immediately. I'm called upon. Um, so I want to uh, then present uh, the speech of the Vice Chancellor. So these are welcoming remarks by the Vice Chancellor, Professor Peter M. F. Bibi, during the public lecture in honor of the late uh, Professor Francis uh, Mwega, held in Chandaria Auditorium, so what we call this space, University of Nairobi Towers, on Tuesday, February 27, uh, 2018, uh, apparently uh, from uh, 3 p.m. Um, I know it is now later than 3 p.m. <laughs> Our keynote speaker, Dr. Ben Ondulu, former governor, Bank of Tanzania, Dr. Patrick Njoroge, the governor Central Bank of Kenya, the family of the late Professor Francis Moura Mwega, Dr. Luis Kasekende, Deputy Governor, Bank of Uganda, Ms. Sheila Mbinjiwe, Deputy Governor, Central Bank of Kenya, invited guests, members of the University of Nairobi Management, staff, students, ladies and gentlemen. It is with great pleasure that I welcome you to the University of Nairobi and to this public lecture in honor of the late Professor Francis Mwega, a man who made great contribution to economics academia. May the almighty Lord continue to rest his soul in eternal peace. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Mwega was a full professor of economics in the School of Economics, and I should have acknowledged the presence of the director, School of Economics at the moment, uh, Dr. Wambogo. So Professor Mwega taught and supervised undergraduates and postgraduate students in the fields of macroeconomics and the public finance. At the international scene, he stood as the ABO ambassador of the School of Economics and the University of Nairobi at large. And what is remarkable is that he did so, saying very little, he didn't talk very much, and writing only what he believed had economic substance and the policy value. Those who did not know him well enough might 
be tempted to think that he expressed or applied his talents sparingly, that is false. In the classroom, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Professor Moega, he used his talents to help students master the complexities of the economic system. And at the time of his death, he was supervising more PhDs, more PhD students than any other lecturer in the School of Economics of the University of Nairobi. In the policy arena, he was no less relentless. He worked tirelessly to ensure that sound monetary policies were formulated and implemented for his country. But his exceptional skills were not limited to teaching, research, and the policy. He served a full term as director of the School of Economics. As a director, he was beloved. As a leader, he was quiet and effective. He treated everybody in the school with equal respect and decency, irrespective of rank or background. In the seminar room, he employed his research expertise to ensure that the highest academic standards uh, prevailed. As an individual researcher, he helped link the economics unit of the University of Nairobi uh, to the vast network of the African Economic Research Consortium, uh, AERC, as you know it, uh, and to its research and training resources. The school is still a major beneficiary of the AERC and is greatly therefore missed. With a delicate balance of work and the family, Professor Moega was able to achieve much. We join his family in celebrating the life that he lived, and he was more than just a researcher. He was a great man. Indeed, we celebrate and honor him. Thank you. This is from the Vice Chancellor, uh, Professor uh, Peter Mbidi, Vice Chancellor and Professor of Veterinary Surgery, on MC. Thank you very much. I wish you all the best. Without further ado, I want to ask uh, a man who we all know, a man who helps to keep this country on an even keel, a man who happens to be my boss, uh, that is Dr. Patrick Njoroge. He's a governor of the Central Bank of Kenya. Governor, please come up and uh, give us a few words. Professor Njero, um, representing the Vice Chancellor. Muheshimiwa Shakil Shabil, representing our, um, I was gonna say our bosses in parliament, <laughs> and uh, indeed the rest of the country. Um, members of uh, Professor Mwega's family, uh, we are very glad you're here. And uh, Deputy Governor, uh, Sheila Bijiwe, Deputy Governors of uh, Bank of uh, South Sudan, Bank of Uganda, Louis Kasekende. Uh, of course, our very own um, speaker today, uh, former governor of the Bank of Tanzania, fellow vice chancellors, my predecessor, at the Central Bank of Kenya, Professor Anjigun Andungu. Well, researchers, students, friends, distinguished guests, good afternoon. I'm very pleased to welcome you all to this uh, public lecture in honor of uh, Professor Francis Moega. Let me begin by thanking the Professor Njeru for, um, for allowing us, and indeed the Vice Chancellor for accepting uh, to co-host this event with the Central Bank of Kenya. As we know, Professor Moega taught economics at the University of Nairobi from January 1985. 
and indeed taught most of the current generation of economists. I'm sure most of you in this room have had a specific uh, connection with him, maybe in class, maybe in your uh, research, or maybe in the, uh, in the, in the corridors um, as we walked around. He has also made a significant contribution to the economy through his research work. I wish to express my gratitude to Professor Ben Ondulu, the immediate former governor of the Bank of uh, Tanzania and long-term friend of Professor Mwega for accepting our invitation to deliver the keynote address. I also want to thank Dr. Louis Kasekende, Deputy Governor of the Bank of Uganda and Professor, um, Professor Wafula Masai for the, from the School of Economics at the University of Nairobi for accepting to provide the initial responses to the keynote address. This event has been organized to coincide with the first anniversary of the death of uh, Professor Mwega, who served as a member of the CBK's Monetary Policy Committee from May 1, 2011, to the time of his death on February 28, 2017. Professor Mwega had previously served in the um, Monetary Policy Advisory Committee, which was the precursor to the MPC from August 2005 to December 2007. Throughout his distinguished career as a member of the MPC and uh, before that the Monetary Policy Advisory Committee, Professor Moega exemplified the highest professional and distinctive humility. He was an invaluable source to the MPC as was shown by his candid contributions during meetings and informative research work on the monetary policy issues. His publications on monetary policy transmission and exchange rate misalignment have en enhanced our understanding of how monetary policy works. Despite his remarkable professional and academic achievements, he demonstrated humility, patience, and kindness in all his endeavors and was a mentor to many of the CBK research family. There are many tributes uh, to Professor Mwega, and I chose this one from Professor Victor Murinde of the school, well, as SOAS, the School of uh, Something Studies, Asian <laughs> Studies, um, in the University of London. I'm sorry, I don't remember what SOAS means, but in any event. Here is the quote from Professor Murinde. The late professor uh, was a personal friend and research collaborator over so many years. We are all very proud of the indelible positive impact he has had on research, policy, and capacity building, especially in the area of monetary policy in Kenya. He was the best of the best, end quote. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm happy to note that this public lecture has drawn a large audience comprising of CEOs and other representatives of the private sector in institutions, policymakers, and other senior government officials. The Deputy Governor of the Bank of, uh, of South Sudan, Mr. Odera Innocent Ochan, Vice Chancellors, and other senior staff from our universities. I also wish to warmly welcome our development partners, including the World Bank and uh, IMF representatives, research institutions, including the African Economic Research Consortium, AERC, KIPRA, the CBK Board of Directors, and current and former CBK governors and uh, MPC members. I'm equally pleased to welcome students from various universities, the media, and other participants from the financial sector, including the CBK staff. I also wish to acknowledge in a special way the presence of the family of the late Professor Mwega in this event. Thank you all for coming. It's now my honor to introduce the keynote speaker, Professor Ben Nondulu, who served as the governor of the Bank of Tanzania from January 2008 to January 2018. Um, as an aside, I can tell you that when I was appointed governor of the Central Bank of Kenya, 
um, and I interacted with him quite well in the context of the various meetings we used to have as uh, um, governors of uh, the East African region and in other fora as well. And it was always nice to have exchange ideas and uh, discuss policy. He too, being a professor, was all very particular about professionalism, the way uh, you explained your arguments and things like that. So I think I've learned a thing or two. Um, thank you very much, uh, Professor Mbenondulu. He started his career at the University of Dar es Salaam in the early 1980s before joining the World Bank as a lead economist. He is best known for his involvement in setting up and developing one of the most efficient, one of the most effective research and training networks in the world, in, in, sorry, in Africa, the AERC. He received an honorary doctorate from the International Institute of Social Studies in The Hague in 1997 in recognition of his contributions to capacity building and research in Africa. Following his PhD degree in economics from the Northwestern University in Evanston, Illinois, United States, he taught economics and published widely on monetary policy issues, growth, adjustment, governance, and trade. And more recently, Professor Andulu has co-authored a book titled Tanzania, the Path to Prosperity, published by the Oxford University Press. The book highlights the challenges of securing economic prosperity in Tanzania in the coming decades. We in the Central Banking Fraternity also recognize Professor Ndulu for his key role in driving the regional integra integration initiatives, especially harmonization of monetary exchange rate and financial sector policies within the auspices of the East African community. So ladies and gentlemen, allow me to invite Professor Ndulu to deliver the keynote address entitled The Conduct of Monetary Policy in a Changing Policy Environment. The keynote presentation, as I understand it, will be uploaded in the, on the uh, CBK and uh, University of Nairobi web websites after this event for future reference. So thank you very much, and Professor Ndulu. Let me start first by recognizing the presence of uh, the family of the late uh, Professor Francis Mwega, a close personal friend. I will also recognize, of course, our host, Professor Enos Njeru, on behalf of the Vice Chancellor, and my good friend, uh, Governor Dr. Patrick Njeroge. I have many friends in the room and very distinguished colleagues so that uh, we don't use a lot of time for that, I would say, all protocols observed so that I don't make anybody feel like I've not recognized. Now, let me start first by just letting you know that uh, Professor, I worked with Professor Mwega for 10 years. I was uh, first worked with him as, when I was serving as Director of Research in the African Economic Research Consortium. He was doing that from University of Nairobi. He was my deputy for the five years that I served as such. And he continued to serve when I took over the mantle of running ARC as executive director. Uh, he continued serving under um, uh, the new uh, director of research. So I feel really privileged and honored to get this opportunity to deliver this uh, public lecture in honor of a close friend of mine. May his good soul rest in peace. Okay, so that's one. Two, from the introductions, I think a lot of people expected the 
very archaic person showing up. You know, when uh, you hear that uh, he had uh, an honorary doctorate to honor his work at, uh, in 1996-97, you think this must be a very old man. And indeed, I was uh, a full professor at the University of Dar es Salaam uh, in 1988. A good number of you not born yet, uh, but I was only 38 then. So uh, don't, don't get confused by what you see and what you hear. <laughs> now, <clears throat> today's uh, talk essentially will build on two sets of experiences. One set relates simply to having been exposed to data and operations of a central bank and central banks in East Africa. And the other one is the fact that I've been at the helm of one of them for a decade. And the period that I've chosen to look at the conduct of monetary policy in a changing, if you want, business environment for central banks is the period that coincides roughly with my own exposure uh, to this uh, particular line of business. So it's partly a reflection of what I've been involved in, but also, a, I think, an arm's length uh, analysis of what lessons that could be drawn. But today, I'm not speaking as a governor or former governor, because I'm also an academician. Now, I'm saying this so that uh, nobody should take me to task for making some fairly strong statements about things. Uh, academicians are protected, typically. <laughs> and I'm seeking that protection. Okay, with that said, now he, here is what I'm going to talk about. Um, first, I think in my own assessment, the conduct of monetary policy in East African countries has been quite successful, and I'll tell you why. Second, I'll also review some of the recent very striking changes in the behavior of what we observe as monetary aggregates and prices, and then try to explain these changes by identifying the key business environment changes for central banking that have and are taking place. And I'll conclude with uh, identifying about four or five major challenges and key risks that central banking and conduct of monetary policy faces as we go forward. Okay. <clears throat> now, there are two sets of uh, indicators that show clear measurement of success of the conduct of monetary policy in East Africa. First, it relates to the achievement of the core mandate of the central bank, which is uh, price stability. And I'll show you that by and large, over the last decade, central banks have been quite successful in keeping inflation within the band for which East Africa has determined as uh, acceptable. I will also show that uh, the other price, which is exchange rate for tradables, has also been reasonably 
stable, save for correction for shocks. And the second key indicator <clears throat> will be to show that uh, whenever central, uh, our countries have been hit by major shocks, we were able to ride through the storm and continue with our journeys. Now, that might sound too successful, but here's the data. This is the path of inflation in all the five East African community countries. You will see that uh, we have had spikes. There is one spike which is not in the picture. In 2008, 2009, immediately after the global financial crisis, save for the spike during that time and two other spikes, mini spikes, uh, which I will describe subsequently, you see that the inflation rate, in essence, has remained fairly much within the band. The, what we call as the upper limit under the uh, East African uh, Monetary Union Protocol, we have actually uh, a limit of 8%. And most central banks have chosen to keep a target in the medium term of around 5%. But as you can see, from 2013, inflation virtually for all the countries is staying within uh, the band, except recently for Burundi, uh, which definitely has uh, breached uh, the upper limit. And when there is a temporary breach, it also tends to go down back to uh, the band. So <clears throat> if you were to measure the success of monetary policy based on its core mandate, which is price stability, this is a track record of reasonably strong success. Now for the exchange rate side, this is the index of uh, nominal exchange rate, again covering virtually the same period. You can see that uh, if you look at changes, not just the index, changes in the index, the spikes are again around 2011 and again uh, 2015. And these two periods, one is associated with the carryover of uh, the global financial crisis combined with the euro crisis which happened around 2011-2012 uh, 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 and I'll come back to that. And the other major spike is actually around the period of commodity price collapse which was somewhere around uh, 2015 uh, for a couple of years. Now that particular collapse is actually ameliorating. Now, that success cannot just be measured in relation to the price stability. If you have price stability with growth actually not doing well, uh, there are a lot of those people that would put question uh, as to whether uh, this success translates into price stability for sustained growth, which is the way the vision of many of our central banks and our countries uh, is actually couched. And again, the track record for this region is reasonable. And you can see that uh, all the five countries, uh, save again for Burundi in the last two years, 
and for well appreciated reasons because of the civil strife which is there, uh, that uh, growth in the region has been not only strong but also robust. Whenever we have had a big shock, growth has decelerated but didn't stay down for long. We always were able to get back up. And this, in part, is what underlies the point that I make in uh, the following slide, which is that uh, our countries in general, and central banks in particular, have had, I think, reasonable success in managing shocks for sustained macro stability. Now, there are three big shocks that uh, we went through in the last decade. The first one was the global financial crisis, which is easily the biggest shock with impacts transmitted through a spike in exchange rates. Unfortunately, in that first one, it was heightened by speculative attacks and expectations that uh, our currencies are no longer going to sustain uh, the pressure. Uh, we did work together as countries and we coordinated our efforts to actually manage uh, the pressures emanating from that speculation. Uh, my good friend and colleague, former governor uh, of CBK, is here. Uh, he, should, he should remember, and again, my colleague from Uganda, that we had several meetings to coordinate action against speculators. And we enacted very similar regulations at the same time. Because partly, we know our banking system is cross-border and actually operates across the regions with spillovers that are fairly strong, which necessitated the coordination. And we were able to remarkably actually put under control the runaway depreciation and collapse of our currencies and re-establish uh, significant uh, confidence in that. That was the first test. The second test was the Euro crisis, 2011-2012. That came later. And again, we faced spikes again in the exchange rate, not as big. And, and again, we brushed up our books, had our conversations again in terms of coordination, and with a significant free hand that we had, and I'm going to speak about free hands uh, later in my uh, uh, presentation, we were able again to coordinate and put that particular anxiety under control. The last one, with my friend who is there now, partly experiencing that part of this, was uh, during this time when we had uh, commodity price collapse. And again, you know what seriously runs volatility in exchange rates, apart from fundamentals, is speculation and expectations on what is likely to continue to happen. And again, we coordinated. And we were able to put that anxiety also under control. Now, I will not give all the secrets out of what we coordinated and how. You know, part of effectiveness of our policy is supposed to be in surprise. And when you lay out everything so that everybody can perfectly, uh, you know, focus your action, people like that, but, uh, you know, when it comes to actual management uh, of shocks, 
and expectations one uh, ought to keep some of the instruments and weapons uh, under up. Not for lack of transparency, but for the good of effectiveness of interventions. So I think judging from the short duration of the stress with each one of these shocks, you remember I showed you on the inflation side. Clearly, we had a spike and control after that. Likewise, for the subsequent shocks. For the exchange rates movement, likewise, they are all very short-lived sort of spikes. And after that, things get under control. So I think being able to manage shocks is one of the most important functions that a central bank can actually uh, play. Because if a shock and its consequences become permanent, it destroys permanently any chance of sustained growth. So that ability is quite key. Now, one other thing that you would have observed and you will continue to observe in the subsequent slides is similarities across our countries. Let me just remind you, see how inflation moves together. It's almost like it's one country. On exchange rate movement, the pattern is exactly the same. We'll see later on monetary aggregates. We have similar, if you want, coherence in movement. So what's behind that coherence? One, and the most important one, is the fact that central banks across our five countries very actively engage and coordinate policies and actions through a committee called the Monetary Affairs Committee of the East African Community. Virtually, we learn together on how to implement effective policies. We analyze together progress in terms of the consequences of the actions that we take. We meet at least twice a year, but very often the committees meet even, the subcommittees meet even more often. And not only that, this region is not together simply because there is a construct called East African community. It's contiguous, it's neighbors. We have cross-border operations, trade, and certainly now financial services. A lot of the actions that have taken place in terms of innovation in the financial sector have taken place in the context of the fact that uh, we learn from each other. This is the cradle of mobile money. And all the East African countries have tended to be on the frontier of moving financial inclusion through this platform. We have learned from each other. Kenya definitely led the way, talked to my colleague, asked him, where did you get the courage to allow these non-bank institutions to start offering financial services and everybody screaming? And, you know, he gave me his part of the story. I picked it up, followed suit, 
Some people thought we were reckless, but we were not reckless. We allowed innovation to take place, we monitored, and then we regulated. It is that kind of a stance of a regulator that allows innovation to work for you. You know, as a policy maker, I can tell you one thing. There is nothing that gives you more comfort than seeing another policy maker having tried something and it has worked. You can read all the books, all the theories. They will never give you that comfort. Comfort comes to a large extent through peer learning. And this is what is behind what you see as coordinated and harmonized, if you want developments in the monetary sphere across the East African region. Now, let me move to the next part, which is what are the sig significant developments that have actually uh, taken place recently, and later we'll go through what is behind uh, those uh, particular sets of changes. One thing that everybody talks about, Liquidity is tight. Monetary growth has decelerated very sharply. We are in a range typically that we haven't experienced for a very long period of time. And you can see across all countries, it is only last year, maybe from the second half of last year, you started seeing again monetary growth going up. And we'll go through the reasons. Partly it's a change in environment and there are fundamentals that we need uh, to look through uh, as far as that is concerned. So one very significant uh, development is the slowing down of growth of uh, monetary aggregates. You look at all the other uh, categories of money supply, including, including high-powered money close to cash. The growth rate has also been in the same direction. Credit to the private sector, which forms a big base in terms of what we call as M2. Also growth has decelerated extremely fast and maybe partly that's one of the sources that we'll be looking at. You know, I know in my own country at some stage and I know in Uganda at some stage actually the growth rate was negative which means the stock of loans to the private sector actually the stock did shrink. And this is probably the most worrisome part because, you know, right now we see there is some recovery starting, but we are still well below 10% in terms of credit to the private sector. And you know, credit is the biggest driver of growth and activity. Part of the story for the slowing down of credit is the rise of non-performing loans. The ratio between non-performing loans and gross loans has risen very sharply, particularly the last two and a half years. Banks are reeling with this particular status. It has raised risk premium and prudently banks are more cautious in terms of lending because 
a significant portion uh, of uh, uh, the loans that they have provided are not being repaid. A loan becomes non-performing, almost this is the standard across East Africa, if what falls due for repayment, principal and or interest is not paid after 90 days. That's the standard that is used generally. And what you see going to almost above 12% in some countries is the proportion of loans that are not being serviced. This is a big issue. Now that issue, fortunately, our central banks, again in the region, have also been over cautious in making sure that uh, capital adequacy ratios and buffers have been put at very high levels to carry situations of this type. If banks were not properly capitalized, this situation would have led to major collapse of the banking system. So my colleagues and friends who are in the banking systems, I remember in Tanzania when we said uh, we'll put now an additional buffer of uh, two percentage points on top of uh, uh, the capital adequacy ratio that we had been keeping. There was a lot of pushback. Now suddenly, under this situation, most of those banks now see what's the importance. And some of the banks, some big banks, have NPLs which are quite high, but they're also extremely well capitalized. So anyone who wants to make a conclusion on the basis of NPLs alone, uh, I think you would not have made the right conclusion. You have also to look at the capacity of the bank or the system to absorb that kind uh, of uh, uh, risk. In any case, this rise in NPLs is partly what is behind the slowing down of uh, credit growth to the private sector. The other development that we have observed is a very sharp decline in market interest rates where the market in this case, I'm talking about uh, market for treasuries. These are the benchmarks anyway uh, for most. You can see recently there has been a very sharp decrease in the yields of T-bill rates of 91 days all across board, all across, across all countries. The same for 182 days. Now, really the story behind this is that credit to the private sector has become so risky, banks and everybody is rushing to that market. Government essentially offers the safety so far, I'm saying so far, with zero risk. It happens in countries that uh, it doesn't stay at zero risk. Once you start defaulting your obligations when papers fall due. And you know, one task of the central bank which is a very critical task, is to underwrite that whatever falls due is paid first, and then the central bank has to deal with the government. And that particular underwriting is the insurance. So when you talk about government, of course it includes the central bank. The central bank can never fall short of money by construct, unless that money gets so bad that nobody 
has confidence in it, like the Zimbabwean currency once once was or still is? Once was. Let me say that as for, for sure. Uh, things are changing there now, so we'll see what, uh, what happens. So, to a large extent, when the demand for this paper is so large that when you go to the auctions, they are oversubscribed, lots of people who want to hold this are not able to hold this, it drives the prices down. People are willing to hold that paper for less yield rather than go and lend to the private sector or uh, go into other forms of instruments. So we have seen this as a big development, but it's linked partly uh, to the uh, NPL's uh, story. So you can see uh, I'm not going to talk about a particular country except maybe in one or two cases which I will uh, refer to before. I'm not hiding behind East Africanness uh, in making the points, but the similarities are so strong that the same points actually do uh, obtain. But what is also amazing, while these rates, the market rates, and particularly the interbank rate, which is the short-term one, have very steeply declined. The lending rate has stayed right up there. In Kenya, it might have moved a little bit down, but it stayed well above the pattern of the movement, again, of the, the other currencies. Uh, not uh, currencies, the other interest rates. Certainly, you can see almost across whether you're looking at Tanzania. I think Kenya's case is slightly different, uh, but not very significantly different because I think the gap between market rates and lending rates uh, also tended uh, to, to widen. Um, one key reason, lending rate has three major components as to how they're determined. One is cost of funds. The other one is simply the cost of managing credit, uh, including profit margins. But by far, the largest component is the risk premium. And that is the component that has not gone down. So it would be strange to expect the lending rate to follow the other rates without dealing with the risk premium. Now, I'll come back to this partly because uh, sometimes we expect that uh, lending rates, and this is what we have done. We have gone on easy money as central banks, uh, which has led to interbank rates going down. Uh, and, but we were expecting that uh, lending rates would follow exactly that, that track. So you do this so that you also bring the cost of credit down. You may bring the cost of funds down, but as long as the risk premium either stays high or increases with increasing NPLs, you cannot cure that part of it by using purely the cost of funds. So I think this is a challenge that, uh, again, we'll talk about uh, subsequently. Let me move um, a little bit faster now. Now, the major changes impacting on the conduct of monetary policy. I've singled out four. One is more frequent supply side shocks, which gives an exogenous impact on inflation. I will not dwell much on that. As long as 
you have droughts, food supply relative to demand becomes inadequate, you will have inflationary pressures, whatever you are doing on the side of monetary policy. If price of oil goes up, talking about oil imports, likewise, inflation is, ba about, is bound also to go up. Again, it is an exogenous stimulus. What central banks can do marginally is try compensate for that and try to make uh, maybe the situation a little better, but that's not the solution. This is one challenge that we have in terms of seeing how we can actually either by managing supply buffers in terms of food or using other forward uh, pricing mechanisms for uh, uh, oil and others. Uh, you can only do that by uh, using these type of instruments, but not through monetary policy per se. Uh, so this is uh, one that I won't uh, actually uh, dwell on a lot more after, after this. But the next three, the sharp rise in transaction velocity of circulation, dilution of fiscal dominance, and changes in the approach of conducting monetary policy, these I'll take up uh, uh, in sequence. What has been happening to, uh, through M-Pesa and other platforms? Quietly has changed significantly. The quantity of money that you need to support the same volume of transactions. You know, if you have balances in your wallet, I'm talking about e-wallet, which is um, like M-Pesa, and you are doing a transaction. As long as you do that transaction without mediation of cash, right? and you continue doing this from one transactor to another, typically what happens is that the same amount of cash now can support much larger volume of transactions than before. That's the velocity of circulation. Which means if the velocity of circulation goes up, the stock of money you need to support the same nominal level of GDP actually becomes much smaller. And this is partly what has been a bit helpful even when the stock of uh, uh, money has been growing much more slowly. The rise in velocity of circulation has tended to compensate partly for the shortfall in liquidity. Now you see, if you drew a line maybe around 2007 with the introduction of M-Pesa, virtually you can track a fairly sharp rise in velocity. Velocity doesn't rise that quickly. This is because of the technological innovation that has taken place. You see where Kenya's velocity of circulation was, and just look at it, December 2016. It's a huge change in a very short period of time. Sometimes we don't take this into account when we are actually doing good estimates of what kind, what amount of stock of money is actually required uh, to support uh, the transactions and particular growth in this. So this has happened virtually in all countries, uh, except in Uganda is uh, not as much, partly because I think uh, uh, this process uh, began a little later in earnest in Uganda, 
they were among the more cautious ones. Uh, they wanted first to see and then believe and then take action. <laughs> you know, some of us saw that much more quickly and we believed more quickly. It's not that they didn't see. They didn't believe quickly. Uh, and that, I think, partly, but that also will change very rapidly there as this also goes up. So this is one business environment for central banks that has changed that we need to take into account. So it's not just that uh, payments have become more, uh, less costly and more convenient, but it has also helped to increase the velocity of circulation. Now the extreme end of this is that you have interoperability of, uh, you know, operating at such level that you don't need cash anymore. Then you become a cashless economy. An M stock maybe may have to go to zero. It will never get there, but uh, this is the direction. So when you see aggregates like uh, money supply going down in terms of growth, or even reducing in actual fact, you shouldn't equate that to also reduction in activity because of the fact that velocity of circulation has uh, changed. Now, the other major, major change. You know, I say here when I joined the central bank as governor, our main preoccupation then was essentially to watch and see how much government has injected through spending foreign savings, be it aid or foreign borrowing. You know, what happens is this. If government has borrowed from outside, they actually have that money deposited in the central bank. The central bank provides the local currency equivalent for government to spend on its budgetary operations. And that process of providing cash against that foreign is a process of injecting liquidity. It grows the stock of money. Unlike the case where you have increased government spending through greater domestic revenue. What happens with uh, funding government spending with domestic revenue? When you are collecting revenue, you are withdrawing liquidity from the system, isn't it? You are paying taxes, you are giving up whatever that you have in liquidity to go into the coffers. The central bank, of course, uh, uh, keeps that on behalf of the government. When government is spending out of that, it gives back the same liquidity to the system. It never adds to the stock of liquidity. So in the past, the rapid growth of monetary aggregates were partly actually supported by the fact that government was receiving a lot of aid in the past, borrowing, whether uh, non-concessionally or concessionally, a lot from outside, and injecting liquidity in the process of using that. Once you remove these, then immediately you have a problem in terms of uh, how do you fill the liquidity uh, growth gaps. Now, here is what actually has tended to be um, the most uh, important effects of these changes, this particular change. I call this reduction in liquidity injecting uh, financing. When donor budget, uh, sorry, when, when donor funded budget, uh, for example, budget support, goes down, this form 
also goes down. When we had non-concessional borrowing more or less come to a temporary halt, we are just starting to go back now to the market. The market was not friendly. Uh, the spreads were very high. After years of borrowing fairly heavily on non-concessional terms, we had two or three years of virtually not continuing with the same. As a result, foreign saving coming from through that route also actually did uh, slow down. So whether it's um, donor budget support or non-concessional borrowing, they actually help to um, uh, inject liquidity. Loans given in kind, and there are many nowadays, like railways, building of railways. In Tanzania, we built the oil uh, gas pipeline. We borrowed 1.2 billion. We never saw a single cent, except for a little bit for workers when they brought in cash. Otherwise, they bring in equipment, they bring in uh, expertise. It's all delivered in kind. It won't be liquidity injected. So it doesn't matter. You can borrow non-concessionally, but it depends on whether or not any of that is coming in in the form of cash, which then gets converted into local currency and therefore injected. Dominance of large infrastructure projects is the other one. You know, typically, as long as large infrastructure projects are implemented by external contractors, that's a leakage, either in the form of imports or fees. It won't have the same impact like if the equivalent amount of money was used in education and paid teachers or in health, paid uh, health workers. That would have an injection uh, impact. And it would have a local multiplier effect. If you pay big contractors, the multiplier effect is also exported. And therefore, in this era where we have very large infrastructure projects which are actually being implemented by externals, uh, contractors, there is less in the form of injecting liquidity. Now, all of us have become very proud in Tanzania. We know that our development budget now is 40% of the total budget, and we like development budget for purposes of uh, growth. But it's also true that if a large part of that is accounted for by large projects, then typically the multiplier effect is much, much smaller because you actually pay for goods and services from outside. Money doesn't circulate the same way. As a result, when we are discussing payment of arrears, domestic suppliers versus external contractors. Because our tendency is for sure to honor the external contractors and domestic suppliers typically are kept on the side. I've looked at the data. When you look at uh, maturities of areas, maturity of areas for local suppliers uh, is much, much longer. It means they have stayed without being paid for much longer than. But this is exactly the channel through which you can inject liquidity into the system and jumpstart the activity and help banks to reduce their NPLs. A good number of these suppliers are exactly the ones that are not able to pay their uh, loans to the banks. So imagine if uh, you had a billion shillings to use 
either to settle arrears of uh, external contractors or, I'm saying or, oh, it doesn't have to be all, oh, or local suppliers. For me, it's a no-brainer. Because under this situation where people are complaining about liquidity, activity is not as robust, and MPLs are high, I would spend that billion certainly on settling domestic areas. Each shilling will have much bigger impact on the economy. I'm not saying don't pay external contractors. That's not. But uh, I'm just giving the economics of difference in terms of uh, who you pay. Okay. I think I, I need to go a, a little faster. So we have, we have seen, we also do this policy rates. Uh, one thing that uh, data shows, uh, there is much better coherence between the policy rate and short term interest rate, like interbank rates, than much longer term rates. And this is work that uh, we need to do, but uh, we see that being tracked much more, uh, I think, efficiently in countries that have adopted already the price-based uh, monetary policy uh, approach. You can see Kenya and Uganda in particular, which is probably one that has for longest been using this particular uh, pattern. Uh, I, I was quite struck by the, the congruence of the pattern between policy rate and the interbank uh, rate. In actual fact, it tells me now uh, my policy rate sort of uh, measure that I should look at uh, more is in relation to what happens to the interbank rate than the other rate, so to speak. Uh, in Tanzania, we have kept the policy rate virtually constant for a very long period of time. It's no more a policy rate. Uh, we are aware of that. Uh, we'll be changing. Uh, as we go forward, yeah. Okay, let me conclude now with uh, what I see as the major macro stability risks going forward. I have four of those. The first one is independence of central banks to pursue price stability and protect the value of the local currency. I'll come back to this. Second, tendency to fix interest rates, a key price of monetary policy, it blunts the efficacy of monetary policy transmission. That's the second risk, I'll speak about that. Third, debt and debt sustainability. And we'll speak about different components. It's not just the overall debt to GDP ratio. There are compositional risks, which I, I want to talk about quickly. And the last one is end to quantitative easing in the United States, which will be followed uh, by Europe. Across all countries, not just in East Africa, there are growing tendencies of wanting to run central banks from outside, the central bank. It's called giving instructions, even if these instructions may actually lead to bad consequences. Independence of central banks is not simply a theoretical, uh, theoretical construct. Imagine fiscal authority that's in need of money can't find money, donors have said no, you can't go and borrow outside, and you have control over the printing press. What happens? Just let it run like hell. <laughs> and what happens? A Zimbabwe. It is important to have that separation because there's potential conflict of interest. Fortunately, I think within East Africa, at least three countries that I know 
have provisions in the Constitution to support that independence. But when it comes to operational, people can't resist the temptation. I can say that now, I'm outside the center bank. <laughs> this is becoming a really, really big risk. Because you cannot guarantee price stability, you cannot defend your currency, because you have tied the hands of exactly the authority that ought to take actions in that respect. If you have appointed my colleague here as, and given them the task, hold them accountable for failing to get price stability and other things. I don't want to mention all the things. But you can't hold them accountable for that and give them instructions on how to do it. It doesn't, it doesn't work. Once you give instructions, then you become accountable. But it never works this way. The best thing is to be able to give instructions without being held accountable for outcomes. It's a natural human you know, position. This I've seen as a major problem across the region, not just in East Africa, I'm talking also about uh, elsewhere in Africa, and it has started to spread elsewhere. And somehow we have forgotten the importance of not tying the hands of those who have given this. Second part, uh, Related to this, of course, uh, we have, I'll talk about this, interest rate controls and directed credit. This is the most frequent pressure you see being applied on central banks, including here. The other one, which is more on the technical front, is rising capital inadequacy of central bank and dependence on fiscal subventions. You know, the way to kill your independence is to become dependent on fiscal subvention. Because you cannot just be given without being given the pro quo. You get the quid and the pro quo. And the pro quo is always instructions. Unfortunately, you know, we have had about four or five years of uh, quantitative easing, where returns to our foreign investments as central banks. I know in my, in my own case, I don't want to brag, I've, this was so much in my head all the time that uh, I left that institution with enough capital in terms of capital reserves to be able to run for three years without getting a single extra cent on the side of income. You need a buffer. It doesn't have to be that much. Uh, maybe it depends on the extent of the fear you feel. Uh, because there are some shocks that can very quickly get you on the bad side, including the one that I'm going uh, to talk about later, which is the end of quantitative easing and the rise in interest rates in the US. And what happens to price of assets when interest rates go up? It collapses. And you have huge revaluation losses. And those really eat into your capital base. So I'm one of those that is a proponent of starting to have capital adequacy ratios for central banks. The same way we insist on having those, for commercial banks, but ours is more for protection of independence to function. 
My suggestion, let's work out what exactly you need to do that. Now, I've, I've, talked a bit, I've spoken a little bit more about uh, tying lending rates to policy rates. You know, I, I, tried, I tried to look at that construct. I found it very hard to understand. I'm talking analytically, uh, not politically. Policy rates are set on principles of price stability. And it depends on a whole range of what's influencing inflation. You may take it down, you may take it up, but the target is inflation. The target is not necessarily to bring down the cost of credit, which is a different step. You may raise policy rate. And you do that for what purpose? You do that for avoiding inflation. It doesn't mean you want to raise the lending rates. So I've, I've, I've had a bit of trouble about how you connect the two and expect them to move as if you are achieving a single objective with both movements. There are two different objectives. This is one, purely as a construct. And certainly I also know that uh, uh, a number of our countries have tried that. We had directed credit before, we had setting uh, of rates. Usually, is to protect the weak and the one that can't afford. You know, once you do that, you actually create a situation for, um, what's the correct word? Rationing of credit. Of course, once you do that, you avoid the very risky ones. And the very risky ones are exactly the ones that are being charged much higher rates. So what happens if those are skewed out of the market, the only other option they have is what? It's the loan sharks, where rates are much, much higher. So we have struggled with that. And hopefully the experience here maybe may be different. But I know experience in the world has been quite clear about that it never helps the weak. It helps those that actually can have access to those loans at much lower cost. And typically, those are people with clout. How you define clout, we leave that uh, more to the political sphere. Debt sustainability challenges. Are we borrowing too much? So far, no country in East Africa is under stress. But some countries are getting very close to the stress line. And what has been worrisome is the pace at which some countries are moving towards that stress line. Right now, it is, it is really, really difficult. I don't expect spreads to go down very soon, particularly with the end of QE and all that is happening in terms of uh, reverse capital flows. Uh, if we have to borrow, and we borrow at very higher costs, at very high costs. The following risks actually need to be taken into account. One is what we call currency mismatch. We have a big infrastructure deficit, we know. And most of 
infrastructure financing actually comes of borrowing from outside. Now, what we mean by currency mismatch is the following. If you borrow from outside to put up a road, put up a rail, telecoms, water, power, the typical revenue stream from these activities is in local currency. You buy your power in local currency, you buy, you pay your bills for telecoms in local currency, but the loan that you have to service is in foreign currency, which means you have what we call in economics a liquidity constraint. The ability to convert your local currency streams into foreign currency will depend on how much foreign exchange you are generating. This means unless exports keep up, you are bound to have again an accumulation of non-externalized debt where local companies have paid in local currency but you have not been able to externalize it. Some of our countries are still having a big problem from previous situation of this kind. That's currency mismatch. Now, I've said here in the last bullet, everybody here has been hoping that we are getting oil and gas, not here only, I'm talking about the whole region. <laughs> We, we, we are expecting gas, uh, Kenya expecting oil, Uganda expecting oil. If it happens, maybe this particular constraint will disappear because there will be enough forex to convert whatever local currency revenue to actually service uh, the foreign loans. But that is inshallah. Risk of maturity mismatch. A lot of uh, infrastructure investments that we're doing now, we use mostly non-concessional borrowing. That's usually shorter term. And of course, higher cost. But sometimes, before the project actually gets completed, you start already servicing debt. You service debt with what income stream or revenue stream from such investment. Because that investment is not done yet. And yet, you know, the lender is here. You start taking money from other activities in order to pay for that. Now, I'm not belittling the fact that uh, in the long term, there would be actually impact. But the incidence of payment, timing incidence, is what we call the maturity mismatch part. So if you want to finance infrastructure, borrow long term, if you had the long uh, um, Loans from the World Bank, we know it's 40 years. There's a 10 years grace period. Yes, you can do that. But if we start going to Euro, Euro bonds, <laughs> we all do that. Yeah, we all do that. But I'm also self-critical for that matter. Those are short term. You start paying even before the rail has started operating. What do you pay with? That revenue, this is a solvency problem. It's a bigger risk than the liquidity risk of the currency mismatch. And I think we need to seriously, again, consider this. Finally, it's the risk related to ease 
quantitative easing in the United States. This, this one is, is quite straightforward. Yeah? We know once interest rates in US and Europe start rising, uh, given lower risk, the uh, risk-adjusted returns are much higher. You know, capital starts reversing from where it came, meaning here, here meaning in East Africa, I'm talking about East Africa, and going back. Sometimes it leaves very rapidly, causing volatility too, which is quite hard uh, to manage. And since at the same time, we have also opened so that we have a, a capital account liberalization, that volatility can be even higher and can actually be a big challenge. But there is one uh, particular effect for central banks more directly, which I already mentioned, which are revaluation losses. We have got to watch for that. Already right now, when you look at the central bank balance sheet, revaluation losses related to price of assets in the US going up uh, are quite significant. You need to find other sources to compensate for that. Uh, but that uh, is a more direct uh, impact on this. Okay, so let me conclude just by saying, notwithstanding all the challenges that I've put across, by and large, the conduct of monetary policy in our region has had good results, but in order to sustain those results, we have to make absolutely sure that the institutions that do that are given the space to continue to do what is needed. Thank you very much. Saying let's give Professor Benondulo a round of applause does not uh, adequately compensate for the amount of work and the amount of insight you've gotten. But you know what? That's all we can do for now. Please give Professor Benondulu a huge, huge A huge round of applause. I think my limited French, I think they call it a tour de force. He has actually covered um, the issue of monetary policy. He has covered issues to do with debt and a lot of other things that all of us are dealing with, whether by way of study or by way of work. Um, so what we're going to do, um, and you've seen it in your program, is now because he challenged almost everyone. The only lucky person here is the governor of the Central Bank of Kenya. He doesn't have to respond. Uh, but uh, the deputy governor of the Bank of Uganda, Dr. Louis Kasekende, and I think there was one bullet in one slide that directly mentioned you. So this is your chance, um, as Idi Amin used to say, to revenge <laughs> on Professor Ndulu. But I think we'll ask Dr. Louis Kasekende to please come and give a response. We'll also have time for all of us in the room um, to feed into this conversation. It's a very important conversation coming at a time in East Africa when so much is going on from both a fiscal and a monetary level. So Dr. Kaskene, please come up. But let me start by uh, expressing my very sincere thanks to the governor, recognize uh, Governor Emeritus, recognize deputy governors here with us, the representative of uh, the Vice Chancellor, distinguished guests. I wish to express my very sincere thanks to the Governor for inviting me to be a discussant of uh, such an important topic, uh, the conduct of monetary policy in East Africa in a changing policy environment given by Professor Beno Ndulu. <clears throat> Secondly, my thanks to the Central Bank, uh, CBK, and to the university for honoring an intellectual who was recognized by many of us in the region, and actually beyond the region. I met uh, the professor at the AERC in uh, 
in, uh, in the early 1990s. And I think you did a very good, uh, you made a good decision to invite Beno. We could not find a better person to recognize that uh, intellectual. In the time I've been allocated, I will disappoint some for not directly responding to Beno. I know he challenged me uh, on some things. We saw, but we didn't act quickly. But finally, we acted on, uh, on uh, the payment system. Let me start by talking about the evolution of policy and the of evolution of markets in, uh, in this region. And I want to take you back. I know Beno concentrated a lot on the recent developments, but take you back to when people like me joined the Central Bank. Some of us have forgotten that uh, when I joined the Central Bank, we were tolerating inflation in the triple-digit range. Inflation in Uganda was about 100%. The central bank had no instrument to respond to fiscal dominance at that time. Bernard did not talk about this, but even the buffers we had, just take foreign exchange reserves. The central bank had reserves to take us just one week. And look at now. People are talking about five months of import cover. Others are talking about six months of uh, import uh, cover. But something else has changed. The public we serve has become more sophisticated. It is not the public we had in the 1980s where we tolerated distortions for very long periods and you do not have demonstrations. Now, the public is more informed and the public is more sophisticated. In one of the charts by Beno, uh, around 2011, inflation went up. We had an average of about 8% for about six, seven years, and inflation went up to 30%. You should have heard the calls by the media, by traders, by local people, that the governor has failed. That never happened in the, in, the, in the 80s. So for central bankers in the room, take note. We are serving a more sophisticated uh, public. Two is that the governments who are our partners in macroeconomic management are better behaved. I know we've had some cases in... Uh, the wider region where a government misbehaved. But I think for this region that we are in, the governments are better behaved. I see more policy coordination between central banks and uh, the ministries of uh, finance. And I think in one of the slides, uh, Beno talked about fiscal dilution. That is, yes, it might come back again, but at least for now, it is not a major source of worry for us as uh, central banks. Now, on financial markets, financial markets are evolving very rapidly. Financial in innovation, telephony, all these things have combined to change uh, markets. Um, the numbers are always very impressive. Uh, users of mobile money now are in, uh, sometimes I read numbers of 20 something in Kenya to, is it 30 now or 26 million people using uh, mobile money? And I think the point Beno has raised that uh, this has changed velocity. Take the case of the 80s, nine, even 90s, when we used to receive missions from the IMF. One thing that we would never talk about was velocity. It was always constant, okay? But now, those operational frameworks we were using are no longer necessary for this region because velocity is not constant. So they were rendered obsolete and it is only proper 
that central banks in the region have shifted from targeting of monetary aggregates to targeting of, uh, of uh, interest rates. And uh, now that Beno is out of the central bank, hopefully you can make more noise for that policy rate to be changed. <laughs> so the message for us as central bankers is that we should be ready to change the operational frameworks that we use for the conduct uh, of, uh, of monetary policy. Let me then move on to, to the success. Yes, monetary aggregates served us very well in the 1980s. We used a combination of fiscal policies and some few monetary policy instruments to deliver on inflation uh, control in, uh, in the 80s. And uh, the operating framework that we were using, I think we should be fair, was quite successful. But there came a point where it was obsolete. We have now shifted, and I think Beno has properly brought up this point, where we have succeeded a lot in this region is using the new policy framework in delivering on inflation. We've succeeded. Look at the numbers. Most of these countries have maintained inflation in the range of about 5 to 8 percent. So that's one success story, and I agree with, the, with Beno. The second one is aligning the policy rate, using this policy rate as a signal to short-term interest rates. That is another one that uh, we, we should recognize. But for us as central bankers, aligning policy rates to short-term rates is not an end in itself. This relationship is strong, yes. Our objective goes well beyond just aligning policy rates to short-term interest rates. Our objective is to influence the whole spectrum of interest rates. Now, that's where we've fallen short. That we've fallen short of properly signaling or transmitting monetary policy to the lending rates. This one is a point of, uh, of concern. But we should also recognize that this is the most important point, or most important uh, relationship which is relevant to private sector agents in, uh, in the real sector. So we can't just march from here and say, well, we've aligned all the interbank rates to the policy rate. They will keep on asking, what about the lending rates that have remained uh, sticky? But we should also acknowledge, and I think this has been picked up in this presentation, that the solution is not only with the central bank. There are so many factors that are interacting. I know Beno has talked about uh, NPS. That is one. But also the structure of the financial markets. We have segmentation in most of our financial markets. You have the bigger commercial banks responding but most of the smaller banks find it extremely difficult to respond to central bank signals. And that's why this transmission has remained weak. Let me now turn to some of the risks I see to inflation targeting light. One issue that we face, and actually it is across the region, is that most of the banking sector, the financial sector, has got structural liquidity, liquidity which is well beyond the requirements of the banking system. Now, ask me, what's the source of most of this liquidity? It is usually government pumping in money. Okay? That's why we are always concerned with this fiscal dominance. We don't have instruments if government decided to pump in money into, into the economy. 
But the other one is in our control. And that is the purchase of foreign exchange from the foreign exchange markets by central banks. As we build up our foreign exchange reserves, we are pumping liquidity into the markets. And if someone said, what would be the solution? We can't stop, the solutions are not easy. We can't say we shall stop buying foreign exchange from the market to build up our buffer. So that's one. But two, it might be extremely difficult telling government that you should stop borrowing from, from the central bank. We have done so, but it is not uh, a very easy one. But the fact of the matter is that the instruments we have at the moment are not ideal for managing central bank, I mean structural liquidity. What do we need? We will have to go back to government to allocate some long-term instruments to the central banks. And the central banks in turn would use these instruments for managing structural liquidity. The instruments can be provided in a form of recapitalization of the central bank. And on recapitalization, I wish to mention that uh, Uganda is moving in that direction you were recommending of having a capital requirement for the central bank. And trying to, we have put it in the law, we have amended the Bank of Uganda law, and it is going before uh, parliament. The second risk is the one of pursuing a twin objective of trying to, to ensure price stability and the exchange stability. When you look at it, the central bank will have two objectives, and in most cases with one instrument. That is a challenge in the conduct of, uh, of monetary policy and it is a, a challenge that is even recognized in the theory. The primary objective of central banks should remain price stability, should remain price stability, but central banks should not be indifferent to the volatility in the foreign exchange markets. And what we have done as a region is to use central, I mean, intervention in the foreign exchange market as a means to promoting stability in the foreign exchange market. Let me then move on to the second area of how do we then build a consensus on the primacy of price stability as a goal of the central bank. The arguments for this, for this particular goal, are highly technical and very difficult, not only for the public and the politicians, but even for the central bankers themselves. We talk about transmission of central bank signal, we talk about uh, the role of expectations in, uh, in uh, the role of, uh, just hold on, yeah, the role of uh, expectations in shaping private sector behavior. These are highly technical arguments we need this is to challenge all central bankers in the room we need to find simpler language if we are going to co to communicate the need for this price for this goal to the public more importantly we need to find some language of communicating to the politicians not that there are no economists among politicians but we need language to communicate to the politicians if we don't, we shall continue to face distortions in the conduct of monetary policy through legislative actions such as interest rate capping. Because if you played out the discussion in parliament, there must have been people giving reasons for interest rate capping, representatives of, of the people. So we need to find a way of reaching out to the politicians and to the wider public. Let me then 
come to central bank independence. In uh, countries that have originally suffered from hyperinflation, it is much easier to recommend that you amend the constitution, provide for independence of the central bank, and assign the responsibility of conduct of monetary policy to the central bank. Like in Uganda, 1995 constitution assigned that role to the central bank, and we provided for central bank independence. That the president cannot just wake up to sack the governor or deputy. That is defined in the constitution. And the reason is the recognition that uh, conducting monetary policy under the influence of politicians, and this is where I agree with Beno, will have multiple probably conflicting objectives. However, this is for the central bankers, just enshrining independence in law does not provide credibility to the central bank. Credibility will have to be earned by us, the central bankers, through a record of delivering low inflation. And the argument for central bank independence will only be convincing if central banks make explicit the ways in which they can be held accountable for their performance in delivering their statutory mandates. And that's, I agree with Beno. We need to go just beyond delivering of inflation, but even answering to committees of parliaments and answering to audit reports by whoever audits the central bank. Let me move on to another area, which is the sharp decline of private sector credit. I agree with everything that Beno has presented in, uh, in uh, his talk, but I want to add on something else. I want to add on another dimension to this analysis. By bringing in the risk of financing the infrastructure projects using infrastructure bonds issued in the domestic economy. Such large requirements of fiscal financing will require a reduction in private absorption. It is another form of fiscal dominance. So we should keep that in, in mind. Now, regional policy harmonization and coordination. The road to monetary union calls for closer coordination among the policy agencies of East Africa and is going to impose binding constraints or binding targets on individual central banks and it will reduce flexibility in the policy frameworks. This should be welcomed by all of us as it is intended to strengthen macroeconomic management. I think you've seen the benefits from policy harmonization even before we get strictly on the road to monetary harmonization. So let us welcome policy harmonization and coordination. That brings me to the end. Let me again express my very sincere thanks to Beno for uh, the very good presentation and also to Governor Njoroge for inviting me. Asante Sana. Let me start with the guest speaker, uh, Professor Ben Ondulu. Uh, I know he has been introduced and uh, recognize uh, that uh, I'm happy that I've been uh, invited by the Vice Chancellor, University of Nairobi, represented here by my principal, my college, of Humanities and uh, Social Sciences, uh, Professor Enos uh, Njeru. And then, uh, okay, I also have uh, many other people I can refer to, but uh, I think for the sake of time, uh, let me just recognize the family 
of uh, Professor Mwega. So recognize uh, the director of uh, the School of Economics, who is my boss. Recognize all the many distinguished uh, participants, colleagues uh, in the teaching profession uh, from Treasury and uh, other ministries, students who are with us here. And uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, I'll mention that uh, all protocols observed. Um, just very quickly, I find it an honor and a privilege that uh, I should make a few remarks in response to the brilliant uh, public uh, lecture. Uh, Professor Beno Dulu was uh, introduced, but uh, he'll forgive me for trying to say this. It may be based on uh, some rumor I had, <laughs> but uh, all the same, uh, beyond his good credentials as uh, an academic, a researcher, facilitator of uh, learning, maybe a development strategist, um, it came to my notice one day that uh, I think uh, while, on, uh, while in Washington, uh, you decided to bid for a higher position than uh, the one you were holding last, Maybe it was a position of, um, let's see, can we get it vice president for Africa region, the World Bank? It may be right, may not be right. And that uh, you were considered the best applicant for that position, but uh, later your appointment could not be ratified because you are considered to be too smart, <laughs> too brilliant, too intelligent. But uh, more specifically, it was mentioned that you are too independent-minded to fill the position of uh, being the director of Africa region. And that, and this, it was mentioned in passing, Africa region is a very important um, region for the World Bank and we cannot have Ben Ondulu to, to be in that position. I think it is the idea that he's too independent-minded. So while sitting there looking at him, in spite of the brilliant presentations, I was thinking of a, a person who is independent-minded, but uh, also just uh, saying the right things and saying them very quickly. Um, I think that speaks volumes of you, and uh, that's why uh, when uh, I was asked to speak here, I said, but why are you asking me to come and do this? Then uh, I was told, uh, well, one time, I think about a decade ago, I was uh, asked to be a rapporteur to a financial sector reforms forum for Kenya, which took place in Mombasa in the White Sands. And the idea was, look, bring in everybody, all the captains of the financial sector, all former governors, all former PSS in treasury, all former ministers, and bring in uh, consultants from all over the world, anywhere, Israel, South Africa, Mauritius, bring them, IMF, World Bank, so that we talk about Kenya's financial sector, uh, the president was uh, Mwai Kibaki, and we had a minister called uh, David Muraria, and uh, I think a governor called uh, Mulei. And all they were saying was, we have a problem in Kenya's financial sector. And you know, monetary policy falls within the financial sector. And then we have banking, we have things like, uh, you know, um, capital markets, we have insurance, many other things that fall under the financial sector. But uh, very briefly, it was considered that uh, every advisor to Treasury and to the Central Bank was given some conflicting uh, interest-based uh, types of advice. Uh, World Bank wanted uh, ABCD to be done. Uh, con consultants from Britain wanted 
different things from Israel. There are some who had identified public enterprises maybe to be sold off. So they considered uh, ownership as the problem rather than the management of public enterprise and so on. And uh, the Kenya Bank Association had its own stories. Of course, the interest rates were about 34%. They were coming down to 27%. And uh, I think part of that meeting was uh, to agree on some minimum things where there was consensus and we move forward with those ones. We identify where there was contention and then uh, we start working on the contentious issues as time goes. And uh, it required that uh, from the meeting in Mombasa, we go and read the budget speech in parliament. Uh, fortunately, I think what I wrote found its way also somehow in the budget speech on the issues of financial sector reform. Okay, so that's my only qualification why, why I'm here. <laughs> of course, uh, I did uh, print and publish a book called uh, Improving uh, Financial Sector Performance in Kenya. So this was uh, proceedings of the first financial sector reforms. And uh, the focus was the issues of access, efficiency, and stability of the financial sector. Okay, um, let me mention quickly that uh, the lecture that uh, was presented presumed a lot of basic knowledge of um, policy, monetary policy issues. It presumed, and I'm saying this mostly for our students, the nature and scope of monetary policy as understood. There are things called tools for monetary policy. There are things called instruments, procedures, strategies, transmission mechanisms, through which policies help to achieve desired effects. It presumed some knowledge of the interlinkages between monetary policy and fiscal policy as they interact. I think I need uh, a little water. Okay, so that's what was kind of uh, expected of uh, an average listener to this uh, brilliant presentation. Let me mention very quickly that uh, at least from uh, the presentation, I gathered that uh, monetary policy is largely anchored on maintaining price stability. And some measures are also taken to strengthen the financial sector in order to improve financial intermediation and its linkages with the real sector. Now, the real sector for economic growth purposes. I also gathered that monetary authorities currently implement active and transparent interest rate and exchange rate policies aimed at strengthening the resilience of the financial system to domestic and external shocks. And that uh, the focus is on regulating the value, the supply, and the cost of money. Basically, three important things so that uh, they are consistent with the expected level of economic activity. Monetary policy then uh, is to allow money supply to grow at an appropriate rate to support sustainable economic growth and maintain internal and external balances. A last point was that uh, direct and indirect instruments of monetary policy are applied. They include managing, of course, interest rates, regulating bank credit, uh, statutory liquidity requirements that are all of us know, and then direct credits and re, re discount uh, windows. 
Now, having mentioned that, let me move straight to my quick comments, given the amount of time. I'll not repeat what uh, the guru himself uh, said. I can't do it even a quarter way. And also the guru, uh, Louis Kasekende, that I've also known for almost 30 years now. Point number one. I just have a, a short and almost incomplete list of what I see as tensions and crises which are experienced by countries. Fortunately, I didn't know that a professor would talk about East African community member states. Now let's assume they are the ones. Uh, later on, it will be necessary to either get explanations and these tensions and crises may be associated with things like globalization as its definitions and uh, they are very well known. We have uh, full courses on globalization and so on, but uh, that one may be creating certain tensions, certain crises, widespread deregulation of markets I'm talking about liberalization being the lessening of government regulations and restrictions in the economy in exchange for greater participation of private entities. That deregulation, I think, is an important aspect to try to reflect on uh, in the context of uh, crisis. There's the problem of uh, technological and financial innovation and this one, I think, was ably uh, discussed and presented. But uh, what I'm starting to fear is that uh, perhaps there are not sufficient regulations to manage what we are now getting ourselves into at uh, this level of uh, technological and financial innovations. Definitely, we experienced tensions and some crises in regard to uh, what we consider the stock and housing market bubble, uh, which is the busting of the so-called dot-com bubble in America, and I think uh, it has been properly uh, presented with uh, spillovers into Europe and subsequently into some of our countries. And finally, I have concerns about uh, the current account imbalances. Um, let me mention very quickly also that uh, I was happy with the, the graphics and you know what appeared like East Africa is doing very well and there are some improvements in certain monetary uh, dimensions. But uh, I, I still have a question that I, I would like to ask my, myself. Is, are we experiencing some robust economic growth in East Africa? And say Kenya for that matter. Is there increasing trade by our region with the rest of the world or not? Do we have an adequate buffer I think that word has been used here severally against external shocks. I'm talking of foreign exchange reserves. Even if we include also the IMF backup uh, provisions, can we talk of deepening international economic and financial integration or not? Okay, uh, these are now my questions about uh, East Africa which means uh, are the East African countries successfully hedging against those volatilities of international capital through accumulation of reserves and, and so on. Uh, what do our current accounts look like? Are we in that current account surplus situation in spite of uh, our countries appearing to be living beyond their means. 
My suspicion is uh, we are living beyond our means, which means uh, that currently we are, there's strong consumption growth, but uh, it's driven by indebtedness. Uh, public borrowing, private borrowing, households are borrowing, everybody's borrowing so that we can consume and then uh, we hope <laughs> that uh, we are okay, but uh, somehow things may not be okay. We have been given uh, that assurance that uh, maybe we are just reaching the limit and things may get slightly out of hand. All right, uh, let me not say much about the good things Professor has uh, in introduced to us. I learned a lot listening to him. I would like to also ask, and now my focus is a little bit more on that financial sector, which for me is a much bigger sector, and I put monetary policy within financial sector, and I put banking, and then uh, capital markets, and so on. If, for example, we are interested in uh, good financial services, there's general interest in uh, access. I think where we talk of ease of client access to services, efficiency and profitability of the operations and uh, stability of the institution. So that's basically the title of this small book here, the issue of access, efficiency and uh, stability. Do financial sectors in the five countries experience similar problems? Do they offer similar solutions so that we can consider that they are progressing almost in harmony uh, in the right directions? Let me also mention, I've already been uh, cautioned to wrap up. In the case of non-performing loans, In the case of Kenya, when we address the issue of non-performing loans, which is a decade ago, at one time it was found that non-performing loans were concentrated more in state-linked banks. And uh, what it really meant at that time was that uh, was associated with borrowing either by public enterprises, which are Kenyan public entities, and lending to politically connected elites who had no intention of repaying the loans. And it was argued that even calling them non-performing loans was a misnomer. Because uh, people took the money without the intention of repaying, and uh, it was not a non-performing loan. It should just be seen that way, considered. Okay, uh, that was the basic discussion. Um, I'm starting to ask, do we, do we have similar experiences across all the five countries or not? Another point how is the banking sector organized in Kenya? And the concern here is, now briefly I was in Nigeria and I was doing something for the African peer review mechanism and uh, I was uh, rapporteuring for the economic governance and management. And it turned out looking at the financial sector in Nigeria um, we concluded, and I recorded, there are too many banks, most of them are too small, and they are not well capitalized. And uh, the solution that uh, we try to recommend, which was, was that, uh, yes, liquidate some of them. If they are undercapitalized, or consolidate them and come up with some consolidated banks and so on. Okay, now, given the pressure, let me mention my last point. <laughs> the capital markets subsector 
for Nigeria was that uh, I just wrote too narrow, too shallow. I don't know whether here in East Africa we have the same problem. Uh, narrow and shallow capital markets. And uh, of course, uh, here we, we are looking at all the dimen dimensions of uh, uh, those membership and you know, issues and, and so on of, of the capital markets. For Kenya, we consider that uh, if we need to have this access efficiency and stability, this need now to have efficiency from the point of view of what are we doing with our banking laws to regulate bank charges, fees, commissions, and to manage deposit and lending rates. Okay, interest rates have been discussed and a lot of things are ongoing and so on, they are known, but uh, I think it's the, the laws and uh, I think you practitioners are in the know. The last point is uh, I would be happy with the corporate and other laws. Bankruptcy and insolvency laws, contract laws, land control acts, building societies acts, bouncing checks, dispute resolution mechanisms, uh, deposit protection, microfinance and so on. We need government laws, acts, and I think this need for harmonization across East Africa. And uh, if that were to be done, and I read that uh, oh, we are moving smoothly and it's harmonious and we are headed towards monetary policy, uh, harmonization, I'll be very happy. Thank you very much. My question goes to Professor Beno. I'd like to just uh, um, a clarification. You are saying that uh, in non-consensual borrowing that uh, there is no multiplier effect. Would you please clarify how about if, it's a non, uh, if it is a concessional borrowing, would there be a difference uh, by just giving a few points that would be relevant in that case? Thank you. Uh, Professor did uh, mention that the issue of we saw in one of the slides there is a re reduction in public lending to the members of the public uh, in all the East African community member countries. And one of the effects uh, we saw that um, we have the policy rates and we also have interest rate capping, which are interest rate capping helps in uh, actually making loans affordable to the members of the public. Like the case in Kenya, the interest rates have been capped, but members of the public are still finding it difficult to access those loans. Uh, and also, we, uh, Professor say that there's harmonization of monetary policy. That's, that's question 1B. So interest rate capping, members of the public are unable to access credit as we thought they would. Yes, but okay. still the same question. <laughs> Actually, I have not addressed my question. <laughs> then, then make it quick. That uh, well, it did mention that there is capping has to go in hand with the risk premium. So my question was, what are the measures that uh, the East, East Africa community member countries have put in place to address the issue of the risk premium, which has to go in hand with the uh, capping of the interest rates, like uh, the case in Kenya? Super, I think we got the question. Um, I think I'll take those ones. Um, quite a number to Professor Ndulu, one we've hijacked to Dr. Kasikende, and then we can see whether we have time for another set. Professor Ndulu. And feel free, you can come here and you can answer from down there. I think the first question was on the status of the common East African currency. Now, it is it is true that our presidents of all the five countries have signed a protocol which puts us on a path towards a common currency by 2024, I think. Um, 
That's the vision. That vision is not a dream only for now. It's uh, being pushed alongside by taking some measures before that so that we can reach there. The current status, as far as the East African Central Banks are concerned, I think has been really to see whether we can create conditions First, for making our currencies convertible across the region, our own currencies. Um, we have set up a new platform. It's called the East African Payment System. I think that was launched about uh, two and a half years ago. It was launched in Nairobi, I, I, I recall. In this system, you can actually make payments across borders with your own currency. Uh, so if uh, I want to buy some goods in Tanzania, I can get goods and pay Kenyan shillings. And what the central banks are doing now is to see how can we deal with a situation if there is excess of currency that's unwanted in one country? How do we square that out across countries? I think that system is being uh, developed. Uh, once every quarter or so, central banks will be able to exchange currencies. But what it means for whoever that is using the system, including Bureau de Change, is that whoever that has excess Tanzanian shilling that they don't want, the central bank should be able to say, bring it, we'll give you Kenyan shillings for it. And when my friend here has accumulated a lot of that, because talks to Central Bank in Tanzania to try to square their position. Look, I have all this excess, and that excess, as of now, would be squared through a third currency. Yeah? And the benefit of that is that not everyone has to go through a third currency in order to do a transaction is only the net which gets squared, you know, by the institutions that are at the apex. It reduces transaction costs. And by the way, for those that know about uh, the problem of correspondent banking, uh, that is one of the possible solutions of making your gross settlement without necessarily having to go through a middle institution that provides uh, a third currency. So, as far as I know, in practical terms, that's where we are, but we are also working on harmonization of policies, harmonization of how we operate, because ultimately that currency will go also with a single central bank with all countries having their national central banks that are part and parcel of that federal system. This federal system has already been defined by our politicians and the president. So it's a protocol which has been signed. So it's not simply a conversation about this. I think if you want to know the reality is that uh, the path has been cleared. Whether we reach there in practice or not, and by when, will depend on a whole range of other things that will uh, take place. I hope I've said this politically correctly, <laughs> so that nobody misquotes me. There is a monetary union protocol Within that protocol, which presidents have signed, there is a date for achieving 
the common currency, and there are steps that have been agreed to move towards that. On the practical front, currency convertibility will be an important step towards getting there once we are able to, to do this. On non-concessional borrowing, so Louis, I'm passing this on to you. Uh, just to see whether you have understood uh, how it gets into monopoly and uh, uh, related concerns that he has. Non-concessional borrowing. Uh, no, what I said is not that, uh, uh, you know, the issues with non-concessional borrowing are essentially two. One is that it is in shorter maturity, which means if you use shorter maturity loans for long-term investments, you do face a problem that uh, you start repaying before investment starts to yield revenues, and that becomes problematic. That's the maturity mismatch uh, issue I was uh, uh, referring to. Um, and, you know, the multiplier effect I talked about was more in relation to how it is used. If it is used in large projects, typically what it means if you are paying contractors that are all external oriented with high import content in the project is that you are exporting partly the multiplier effect because if whoever that brings in goods from outside for implementation of the project, if they also buy other goods in order to supply those, that process is taking place in a different country. It's not taking place here. If you use that to buy cement, and that cement uses limestone, which means the mining uh, firm of limestone uh, also gets into activity and is being transported uh, the limestone gets transported and related. I have used a very short sort of uh, chain uh, activity. You know, all the additional activity takes place in the country and creates activity in the country. The same way I talked about paying arrears to an external contractor, that money goes out, yeah? And it does whatever it does, wherever that, that money actually operates. Uh, but if you pay a supplier of food to prisons, you know, the farmers get into it, the transporters get into it, the millers get into it. Uh, that particular process that you reactivate by giving money and space for that activity to whoever that is here creates that multiplier effect within the country. If you went purely on demand side, it's the same. You know imports are called leakages as far as aggregate demand is concerned, if you want to go straight economics. But if you pay somebody here, aggregate demand in this case actually uh, rises within the economy and has that impact. So it is more in that context, not to say non-concessional borrowing automatically doesn't have a multiplier effect. No, it can. It all depends on how it is used. I think uh, that was, for me, the, the private sector credit interest rate capping is for current Central bankers. <laughs> Was it Philip who asked this question about uh, interest rate capping? Let me first go back to an equation that was given to us, a very simple equation given to us by, by Beno. The lending rate 
has got three components. There is the cost of funds, the costs of intermediation, and the risk premium. The financial institutions should be compensated adequately for them to participate in intermediation. They should be able to cover their costs of the funds. They should be able to cover their intermediation costs. And they should be able to cover the risk. They need to be compensated for taking a risk. In those situations where they are not adequately compensated, there will be a crowding out effect. And I think that came out in the presentation that the higher risk uh, segments of our economy may be crowded uh, out. And I think that's what we are seeing in some of these jurisdictions. Two is uh, the risk premium. I mean, no, it, what, would we, what would we recommend at the level of the East African community? Given that we have an objective of financial inclusion, given that we would have an objective of reaching out to different segments of uh, the economy, especially small, medium enterprises, interest rate capping would not be one of those policy options we would recommend to the politicians. I think that's the simple answer. At the level of East Africa, it would not be an option that we would recommend because it runs contrary to our other objectives. Now, the politicians may have an objective of uh, access to credit at lower rates, but maybe this is an objective they should fulfill outside a banking sector that is commercial in nature. They can have other institutions set up for that purpose where the objective of access to credit at lower rates can be uh, realized. So that would be my uh, answer. Our main uh, presenter, Professor Benondulu, our two respondents slash discussants, uh, Dr. Louis Kasekende, and also Professor Fula Masai. Uh, before the leave stage, we are Africans, and Africans never just say, um, thank you, and they let you go away. We always have to give you a bag of maize uh, when you come and visit us, so you do a good deed to us. So I want to ask um, our Deputy Governor, Sheila Mijua, to please um, grace the stage. Um, and I'll ask our Deputy Governor, I call her DG. So whenever you come to the Central Bank, there's GSUs all over, so you can't just come to the Central Bank. You have to get an invitation. But if you do find your way to the Central Bank and hear people talking about DG this and DG that, DG is a Deputy Governor Central Bank. Um, this is Sheila Mijo. I'll ask uh, our DG to come up on stage. She's going to do two things. Um, number one is to give a vote of thanks. And number two, um, equally importantly, is to help us with giving the bags of maize to our honored guests so that we can thank them adequately for the great work that they have done. DG. Good evening, everyone. Uh, it's been such a pleasure being here. I'd like to start by asking the family of Professor Mwega to stand one more time and let us clap, clap for them. You can sit. Um, I had the pleasure of working with Professor for seven years in monetary policy. Um, generous, quiet, kind, um, a really a perfect gentleman, a team, team builder, and a thought leader. Um, I'm sure you felt honored to have shared your lives with him, and we felt honored to have also had a piece of his life in the way that we interacted with him. Thank you again. I'd also like to, at this stage, recognize the governor of the Central Bank of Kenya, Dr. Patrick Chiroge, um, our co-host, um, Professor Jeru, thank you very much for making this occasion possible with us. Uh, Professor Benno, I have to be careful what I say, I'm still in the Central Bank. I know today you have spoken boldly and we thank you for that. We thank you also for bringing the East African Union together 
that's where we are. We're all together, and as we go down this journey, we need always to be cooperating with each other. Kaskende, I always call you my brother, and you can see I'm not giving you proper respect. I'm giving you Dr. Kaskende. Um, we travel a lot together, and another person who's very ke uh, generous with his thoughts and knowledge, he's told us today that um, central bank communication is necessary. We need to understand each other. Credibility of a central bank will be earned. It won't be given. And he's told us also that we're dealing with a very s sophisticated market that we learned, have to learn to manage. I would also like to recognize another of my brothers, the Deputy Governor of South Sudan. Um, we're kind of like a, a tribe. We mix together and we remain together. And we have a lot in common. Thank you very much for finding time to be with us today. And thank you also, um, your governor, for allowing you to be with us. We know he had another engagement and he, he agreed that you should come and, and spend time with us. We have CEOs from various institutions, both public and private. We have members of the media fraternity with us today, representatives of research institutions, development partners, friends and students of the late Professor Mwega. I also want to recognize from the bottom of my heart, the presence of the board of the Central Bank of Kenya, which really speaks to our unity and why it's easy for us to work together. Um, when you see the board and the management at functions like this, you can understand the unity of the institutions. Thank you very much for making time to be with us. Former monetary policy members, I've seen you, I recognize you. Thank you for coming. And former CBK governors and deputy governors, again, thank you very much for coming. To all of you, I say thank you, and God bless you all. Uh, we thank you for... We thank you for helping us and helping the prof uh, in all his decades of work. So thank you very, very much. I think we can allow everyone to um, vacate the stage.